Ray, welcome to the podcast and thank you so, so much for coming on. Thank you very much, Ashlyn, for having me with you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Firstly, I suppose just tell us a bit about yourself. Now, I know most people will know who you are, but I just want to know how you would describe yourself in a nutshell for the very few that might not know who you are. You know, that's a tough question because sometimes <laughs> I don't know, do I know myself? Um, <laughs> I suppose what I try to do is I try to give a political representation uh, that is down to earth, mm -hmm. that is honest, that is factual. Uh, if I hear the people that work with me, if I can help people and if I can do something to improve their lot, I like to do that. Right. I like to see people uh, get on in life. I, I like to see young people, uh, which would be of interest to you, maybe and many of your listeners, um, there's an awful difference between wanting to travel and having to travel. Mm -hmm. There's an awful difference between uh, wanting the experience of working abroad and having to work abroad. I hate to think of people saying to themselves, like we had an awful lot of it during the 1980s, for example, or go back another step to the 50s when all my own aunts and uncles had to leave because there was absolutely nothing for them in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And um, if people make a choice if there's job opportunities for them here or abroad, and if they make the choice that, well, we'll go abroad, that's that's very nice. That's great. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, but forced immigration is not good. Mm -hmm. Definitely not, no. And I feel like it is. I, like, I did leave Ireland initially just because I wanted to travel. When I was years ago, and by, I'm thinking I, Ireland isn't appealing to me at this current moment to come back to with regards to rent prices and different things like that Do you know what i mean so yes yeah but um going back to yourself and how you first started off with politics like obviously politics is massive in your family from your father to your brother yourself and now even your your kids but what was it like growing up with your father jackie in politics well, I, whenever I'm asked that question, I always give the unusual answer that um, uh, nothing personal against anybody. But <laughs> I, when I used to hear about a TD dying, uh, I'd, I'd be delighted because when a TD used to die, it meant there'd be a by-election. If there was a by-election, my father would be involved in fighting that by-election wherever it was in the country. Yeah. I was in the na national school at that time. And of course, it meant two or three weeks off of school. Right. And uh, now I didn't go to any type of university or anything like that. But I suppose going to by-elections and working in those by-elections, it wasn't as though it was a DAS or, or you were off of school and, and that you would have a great time. It was working. It was doing the donkey work that's involved in elections as a young fellow would be put at it, putting up posters, giving out leaflets, doing what needs to be done, the, 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 the ordinary day-to-day -day work that's involved in a campaign. I learned an awful lot during those campaigns. A lot of interesting things happened. Um, I remember we were involved in by-elections that we won and, uh, and that we lost. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like a football game. You can't win every game. And uh, it got you used to what defeat was like as well. Uh, because every time an election is won, well, somebody else is on the losing end. And mm -hmm. all that's an educational curve that you can't buy in any school or in any university. Mm -hmm. And uh, seeing people's different organizational skills. My father was a great organizer. He was a great motivator. Uh, he was a great person to get people to give their best and give their most. Mm -hmm. uh, I subsequently directed his uh, all election campaigns, which meant that I got to work with a great group of genuine people who were genuinely committed to supporting what what he believed in and subsequently what I believed in. And when did you first realize that you wanted to get into politics? Like how old were you and what was it exactly that appealed to you about it? Well, I always tell the story about how I, how it was decided that I should run for the council myself was, um, you see, when my father became a TD, he was also still a county councillor because there was this thing at that time, the dual mandate, you could be both, you could be a local politician and a national politician at the same time. So an election was coming up uh, in the offing, a council election, and uh, we were doing a clinic one night, uh, myself and my father back in, in Larrock to assist and uh, down us all that direction. 
and uh, we had a great man who used to canvas with us locally in the back of the car, Joe Riney. And uh, Joe said during the course of our travels that night, well, sure, Michael, you'll have to run for the council in the Calargillan electoral area. And uh, I, I, like it actually hadn't occurred to me that I would have to do this. Mm-hmm. And I said, Joe, why, would I, why do I have to? And he said, well, sure, the people voted for her father for the doll. And are you now going to tell them that they can't vote for a Healy Ray because there's going to be no Healy Ray on the ballot paper in the Clarkland Cl- electoral area, which encompass- encompassed, do you know, Khmer, Sneem, Kessel Cove, Cahadanel, down into Wathamal, Karasivin, South Kerry, all that area. And um, so it was actually Joe Roine that made up our minds that night because myself and my father discussed it when Joe got out of the car. And he said, we're listening to what Joe said. And I said, I was very closely. And I said, he's making a point. So it was a sort of a natural realization that if we were going to consolidate on the Dahl seat and give local and national representation, that it was important to, to try and spread uh, the, the evenness of, of the work and delivery that we would be doing to people and trying to help people in all areas. Yeah. And how old were you at that age? Uh, I, it's a, uh, it's, it's over twenty years ago. I maybe maybe early early thirties, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Late twenties, yeah. early thirties. Yeah. And you, I heard you once said to Lucy Kennedy that if there was an award for the worst dad ever when you when your kids were growing up, that you would win it. What makes well, I would. Yeah. Yes. Well, I I suppose what what I mean by that is mm-hmm. I never let on to be something that I'm not. And do you know the way there's very, very good fathers there now? What I mean by that is that they're very attentive mm-hmm. and that they're 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 sort of there for everything. Well, I suppose the best way to describe it is I was always somewhere else for everything. In mm-hmm. other words, if a, you'd you'd often hear people saying, Well, do you know if I had to make a choice between uh, being at home to do such a thing or work. Oh, well, I'd always choose uh, being at home and, and all that. Well, no, I, I don't tell lies. I would be the exact opposite. Yeah. Um, what, we'll say in order of priority, my first job was was watching my father's back. In other words, if there was meetings that he would be attend, asked to attend uh, and couldn't go, I would go. Mm-hmm. Uh, if his, we'll say, if his ears were needed in a place it was I was his ears to be in that place, whether it was north, east, south, west, or mid Kerry. I was at everything, mm-hmm. and uh, if there was an envelope being opened, I'd be there standing there, uh, representing him. And um, at that time, you see, he would have been supporting government governments, and uh, each time there was a vote called. There was no such thing as, well, he didn't have to be in the doll for a vote. He had to be there for every single solitary vote. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was very time consuming. And uh, I had, a, I had a, in my opinion, I had no choice. I had to do the job properly. Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't have been the best, we'll say, for uh, all the attentive things that are needed at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, so being blunt about it, I would not have been at home. You know? yeah. so uh, that's just a fact which must have been tough though because there's five kids isn't there so Eileen must, yeah, sorry, your wife Eileen must have been flat to the mat well yeah but like look I suppose that comes with having patience and exactly. and understanding that well like this is it and uh, and then of course when I became a councillor myself uh, I only barely barely got elected and mm-hmm. I wanted to grow on that and I wanted to give a representation. I asked the people at that time to please, please give me a chance and that they could have me that time then and sack me the next time if, if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and in other words, if I wasn't up to the grade, uh, just give me an opportunity now, which was that time, and then get rid of me at a future date. And I worked as good as I could. And I, I, I'd like to think that I, I became a good politician for them in all parts of that area and and beyond Mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't stop at the boundaries in other words if I could help a person in any part of Kerry when I was on Kerry County Council I didn't ever say to a person oh well you're not in my electoral area you know I don't need to help you at all I I didn't care if a person was 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 from Sneem or from Timbuktu if I could help them I would you know Mm -hmm. or try to help them Mm -hmm. And um, 
your your wife Eileen runs a, a shop in Kilgarvan. So how did yourself and Eileen meet? And did she have any idea what she was getting herself into when she was marrying a politician and, and going into a politician's family? Well, I suppose, look, you know, when anybody uh, starts out uh, with anyone else, do they ever know <laughs> where they're going? Sometimes no. you barely know where we're coming from, not to mind where we're going. And uh, <laughs> things things evolve and sure, yeah. that's it. You know, you yeah. can do nothing about it. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and you're a busy, busy man. Everybody knows that. And you're always, people are calling you, people are ringing you, asking you for favours. But are you able to switch off and put the phone away when you need to? Or do you find it hard to switch off? No, I don't ever turn off the phone, to be honest. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I feel when you're involved in politics and when you're involved in public representation, I actually don't believe that you have the right to turn off the phone because mm-hmm. what about if somebody needs you? What about if there's trouble? What about if somebody urgently needs your advice? And um, I, 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 I'll tell this quick story, which will let you know how important it is not to turn off your phone. Uh, one night, um, I, I don't sleep too much as a rule, but um, I had come in home and I was sitting on on uh, on my chair by the by the stove, and my son happened to be uh, asleep on the couch, and uh, my phone rang and it was it was twenty to two, and whatever when <laughs> immediately when I answered the phone, I just there was something about it, and this man said hello. And there was no missing, there was no nonsense, because sometimes you do get people that might be out with friends and they'd ring, you know, mm-hmm. not out of big adding or anything, but they'd ring just saying, oh, we'll ring your man type of a thing, and they might have a little drink or two on board. <laughs> but this man, it was a very cold, calculating hello, you know, mm-hmm. and I said hello there, and I didn't ask him his name, and something made me not ask him his name. And I said, how are you? And he said, not too good. And I said, uh, why? And he said, well, I tried the Samaritans, he said, and there was no reply. And to be honest, he said, if you didn't answer the phone, uh, that was it. And I said, how do you mean that was it? And he said, well, I have a gun here, he said. And uh, to be honest, he said, I, I'm not, I, I can't stick this anymore, he said. So right away, I know a lot about guns. So I said to him, all right, I said. And I was very matter of fact, what type of gun is it at all, I said. And he told me the type of gun it was. And the minute he told me the type of gun it was, it told me that he wasn't a fella, you know, just making this up. Oh, I'm here with a gun. Like, he, he did have a gun. So I said, all right. I said, is the old cat on or off? And he said, it's off. And I said, well, um, you know, we'll talk away. No, I said, but you know, would you just do me one small favor? And I didn't tell him put the gun away. I said, would you just put the catch uh, the other way? No, I said. And not only did I know that he did it, I heard the kick when he put the catch on the other way. So we talked and we talked and I suppose we definitely talked for over an hour. And two things that I didn't ask him. I didn't ask him his name. I did say, are you in Kerry? And he said, I am. And I said, you're in a rural area, are you? And he said, I am. And he was in the house on his own. And uh, we talked about every aspect of life and uh, lots of different things. And, uh, you know, he was actually a lovely man, a terrible, nice, sound man. And uh, w- when we were coming towards the end of our conversation, I said, I'm going to ask you one thing now. Do you promise me, I said, that you won't kill yourself tonight? And he said, I do. He said, he was very matter of fact about it. He said, you know, I enjoyed our talk. And you see, what I kept emphasizing to him was the dawning of a new day is a great thing. And if you can live until morning, that morning, it could hold great things. The weather might be nice. I had said simple things to him. Like I said, you know, like tomorrow now when the new day will come, you know, eat something that you like eating, you know, ring people that you might like to talk to, go somewhere that you might like to look at something. If there's a job that you might like to do, do it tomorrow. And when we finished up anyway, the one thing I asked him was, do you promise me and swear that you won't kill yourself for the immediate future? And he promised me. And I said, because I said, you do know you'll be letting me down. And he said, how, how do you mean I'll be letting 
you don't. Well, I said, people don't shoot themselves in Kerry every day. And if you'll shoot yourself, I haven't asked you who you are, or I'm not asked you who you are. But I'll know that you will die in the next 24 hours because I'll hear it. And I'll say, oh my God, that was the man. And I said, he knew that I had already lost a person one time before through political inexperience and not being good enough at my job. And I, 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 I lost a man uh, that I always felt I could have helped more. And um, so anyway, we parted on very good terms and uh, he, he guaranteed me that he wouldn't kill himself. And um, when I put off the phone, I suppose maybe I took a bit of a breath and I was, that was like, you know, that was a bit severe like. And all of a sudden my son opened his eyes. He was on the couch. And I must remember now at that time of the night, there was no other noise in the house. There was no radio in the background. There was no television. Hadn't my son heard the conversation, we'll say my side of it. He couldn't hear every word that the man had said. But my son said, oh my God, he said, like, I said, how much of that did you hear? He said, the phone ringing woke me, but I didn't open my eyes. And he said, I, you know, I, you weren't into the conversation for a minute. He said, when I realized what was happening. And um, so you might say, why did I tell you that story? The reason I told you that story is because you asked me, do I turn off my yeah. phone? Mm -hmm. Could you imagine if I was selfish and when I go to bed, if I was to say, all right, I must turn off my phone or put my phone on silent because I don't want to be disturbed. Like, that's, can you see how outrageous a thing that would be? Yeah. If for the rest of my life, if if I kept the phone on every night and if it never again rang, wouldn't it worth having that habit for that night? Because yeah. if that man, remember what he said to me, I rang the Samaritans, I reached out, he said, and no one answered. And... Uh, you must be there to answer. And fine, you can have childish nonsense. You can have p people who are messing, uh, you know, yeah. a group of friends out and saying, oh, you know, we'll blagard this fella, you know, people that mightn't like me, which mm -hmm. happens a lot. You have people ringing up and, you know, saying dirty things. And But look, <laughs> that's all part of it too. And I'd have, I'd, I'd have a word for those people as well. That, um, <laughs> you know, if people like that think that they get, to, to somebody like me by doing foolish things um, I actually should have kept it I, I, I got a postcard yesterday and uh, to, uh, if I had it here now I would actually show it to you I mightn't read it to you but I would have showed it to you but I know I doomed it yesterday was it um, bad? It, it was horrendous like horrendous <gasps> And, uh, and the language and to know exactly what type of a person I was and all this. And, uh, but like, I was laughing at it. And the reason I was laughing at it was because the person that sent that, they, they honestly thought that they would upset me by sending yeah. me a stupid postcard with dirty stuff written on it. And uh, like, you know, all of the time, too polite. If the person was able to see this podcast i'd love to tell them what to do with their next next cross <laughs> they're obviously just very unhappy in themselves but phone calls like that i mean like that must be severe pressure like you must feel severe pressure receiving calls like that because i know as you said yourself that's not the first kind of that's not the first um thing like that that's happened to you or that's not the first phone call you've had like that no it's not but i'd hope that i'd learn um in politics you usually get people that like to give the impression that they do things right all the time and that oh do you know i'm always right type of thing well i'm not and and like i say i i made a woo woo one time and um it didn't res it didn't end up too well and uh you know, you'd always regret that, but you you try to to make up for that thing by mm -hmm. being better the next time. Yeah. And uh, I suppose you, you the one thing that you get to know and to understand and to learn is that uh, no one of us is perfect. I'm definitely not perfect. And uh, I suppose all a person can always do is try to be there for people because life has gone to the stage now that people are under a lot of different pressures and um, it's amazing, you know, people talk about young people uh, being in trouble when say with their heads, um, older people too, like it's yeah. amazing, yeah, you know, yeah. the fact that older people are 
are called off as well. Uh, that's very worrying. Uh, I give many years on the Psychiatric Services Committee. I'd like to think that I learned a lot at that time. Mm -hmm. It was on the old Southern Hill Board. And um, like you could wake up tomorrow and you could have a sore back and a sore arm, or you could wake up tomorrow, as I, I, I tried to politely put it, with from the neck up trouble. Mm -hmm. And uh, and like, you know, well, it's just a pleasant way of putting it because to me, yeah. there's no difference if you have trouble with your head or if you have trouble with the rest of your body. Uh, like th that's that's all part of it, like, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you just have to be willing to accept that and to start to say, right, I must do my best now and get on with my lot in life. And uh, and I think each one of us have to try and help each other, you know. And especially with that aspect of the job, does, does the job ever get too overwhelming and stressful? Like, are there ever times when you just feel like this is just too much? No, no isn't it funny? And it's an unusual thing to say. Uh, I do well with stress. I, I sort <laughs> of, yes, I, I can handle, you know, I can go from one problem to the next and from one calamity to the next. And, you know, if there's things going wrong and if the whole world seems like it's falling in on top of me with this and with that and with the other thing, it doesn't actually rattle me too much. Right. And I am a, I, yes, I am a human being somewhere inside maybe, but it's very, very deep inside. Like, you know, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be at it a long time to find it. And, um, so I, I start to just get on with it. And, uh, but how I, how I think I do that is all of the other stuff, which I would consider and call small stuff, if, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean by that. Like things that might bother other people don't bother me in the slightest. Right. Uh, the day-to-day -day tribulations that happen that people might lose their lives over. You know, when I hear, you know, a person, being upset over something small, mm -hmm. uh, like those are the things that I block out completely. I take no notice of them. And and like, it has to be a big serious problem for me to actually say, God, I'm worried about that, you know? Yeah. Because, like what? Give me an example. Arish, in other words. Well, you, you, mean, you mean the small things? I mean, like the small things to me are like, you know, I don't know if we, I don't know, food a nice shiny car and if we screw up the side of it. Yeah. Like, you know, do you know the way somebody else could be, oh my God, they'd have the head <laughs> lashed over it. Like, I'd only, I'd only laugh at things like that because they mean nothing and they're, they're small things, like, yeah. and they don't matter, do you know? Mm -hmm. And, and like, if, 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 if something, I don't know, something silly, something minor, all of these things are, they mean nothing. They are nothing. In the greater equation of life, they mean nothing. Yeah. They're just tribulations. But mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the serious problems. It's the, when people come to me and if they have illness and, yeah. and if, they're, if they have issues like that, th those are what I call problems. Yeah. And these are things that you need to overcome. And uh, recently now, just freshly in my head, um, so obviously, we, we, I won't even give the correct age, but um, we'll say it's a youngish person, a teenager, in a part of Ireland that has recently become um, permanently uh, disabled through an accident. Mm -hmm. So that person, that family, they have life altering changes. Mm -hmm. uh, so from a housing, medical care, future educational needs, their whole life has been turned upside down just yeah. by one second of an accident. So I'm trying to help those people now and, and help them get on uh, with, with, with the problems that they'll have. And um, like, how would I put it? That to me, you know, that's serious. Yeah. And that's what you have to keep your head free for. And don't be wasting your mind space with, with small, trivial stuff. Keep your, keep your main focus on those bigger issues. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that that families like that will need every bit of help that not just one person, but all the different agencies of the state will have to be there to help and provide assistance with. So that's, that's the big stuff, if we're not. I mean. Yeah. And what would you say has been your biggest mistake or regret, we'll say, over the years? Um, you know, smart people say that youth is wasted on the young, 
right? Mm. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stupid thing to say because you can't do it, but I still can't stop myself from saying it, is if I could go back to when I was younger, I, I do everything differently. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I suppose, and in fact, I'd probably do the same in, in other ways. In other words, the most valuable thing in the whole world, it's not money, it's mm -hmm. not possessions, it's the one thing that you can't buy, and that's time. So I always encourage people, I go to schools a lot, national schools, secondary schools, but I say this to young people in national schools, but I, I, I reinforce it big time in secondary schools, and that is about wasting time. And again, it's politically probably incorrect to say this to young people especially, but I say it to them anyway, about sleeping, that uh, they should train themselves to try and always manage with as little sleep as they can possibly get away with right. and, and not make themselves sick. And what I mean by that is, and I'm not talking now about being a drudge working or, or like anything like that. Of course, work is terrible, terrible important. But what I'm talking about is not wasting time. Should I mean every minute that you give with your eyes closed, like that is actually a minute wasted. Because sure, when your eyes are closed, you don't know what's happening around you. You can't do the things you might like doing or not like doing. You're, you're wasting time. Okay, I know you have to charge your battery as such, but like, there's no need to have it overcharged and overcooked. Like, <laughs> you know, the bare charge will keep you going. Yeah. Your phone will operate even if there's only one bar of power on it. But it, it doesn't have to have five bars on it all the time. So yeah. I think some of the times I might not be operating on half a bar, but, but like <laughs> half a bar will still make the call. So it's, it's the same way with the human body. And um, so my biggest regret if I could go back, of course, I do. I do. I do things smarter. I um, I I I took a lot of chances and risks when I was starting out. Um, um, I did things that maybe youngsters now can't do because they, they won't flipping well be given the opportunity by banks, which I uh, is a, we won't even get into that because young people are being denied opportunities by lending institutions because they won't give them money. Mm -hmm. They won't take a chance in them. They won't uh, take a risk with them. And to me, that's what banking is all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was fortunate in that I did have people that, that were willing to take a chance on me. And, uh, but I, 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 like everyone in life, I, I would do a million things differently if I had a second chance. But sure, how do you all know? Maybe, maybe, maybe we are going to be born again in, in some <laughs> other different way. And, you know, we'll come back exactly. as a golden retriever called Rex or something like that. And we'll <laughs> have a great time. You know? so, so exactly. Who's to know? Who's to know? Who's to know, yeah. <laughs> and um, so you're obviously always very busy. I think everyone knows that. But what, what's a typical day like for you? Like today now, what, what are you doing now for today? Well, I, I'm here in, in, in my in agricultural house, which is um, where my office is. Mm -hmm. And today is a doll day, so it's a Dublin day. So right. my time is divided between Dublin and, uh, and Kerry. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 things like, I, I like going places where I can go in a car. Everybody knows I don't like airplanes. I don't like <laughs> travel. Uh, you're you're many miles from home now where you yeah. are, and and a lot, lot of people of your friends, you, you all travelled. Like I know, unless I'm drugged, knocked out, and put in a box <laughs> and taken to Australia, for example, I will never see Australia because I would not. Unless Australia moves nearer to to, <laughs> to Ireland, I won't be seeing it in my lifetime. You won't uh, be coming so to I, visit me, so I have a spare room here and everything, like. No, no, you're, you're lovely and everything, but I'm afraid unless you come here, I won't be going there. Uh, no, I, I, I don't like, I've been to America, right? Uh, yeah. But um, like it would only be on, a, on, on a, an, an, an absolute needs basis. Mm -hmm. So I, I like the routine of work. And I then outside of politics, uh, I, I like ordinary work. Uh, do, like what I mean by that is like putting on a pair of Wellingtons or a pair of boots. Yeah. And go away whether it is drive via digger or just doing ordinary work like mm -hmm. everybody knows i like that um and once i'm busy like whether it doesn't matter whether 
like I said, whether it is driving machinery, whether it was operating a shovel or a chainsaw, or, or like, you know, the, there was a very good friend of mine, um, Jerry, I don't know who, a, a great teacher. And I remember one day he was having to give me out to be in school. And he said, um, he said, Michael, are you going to make your living by the peak or the pin? And uh, so I suppose the way I'd like to put it is I do both. I like the peak and I like the pin. Yeah. And uh, the two diversities of life. Like I'm not a person for putting on a suit, uh, you know, every day. And that I, I like a suit. Like we'll say when I was growing up, if you told me that part of my future life would be putting on a suit every day, I would have said, you're mad because <laughs> I couldn't have envisaged that. But uh, like every young person, sure, nobody knows what life holds for them. But mm -hmm. but but my encouragement to everybody would be whether they're in Ireland or abroad, like use every hour of every day because this is not a practice run. This yeah. is not a testing of the waters. Like from zero to a hundred. I have a friend, all right, who's a, his next birthday. He'll be a hundred and eight, and he's in great form. Michael O'Connor, but I, I, I don't think many of us will live to be, uh, you no. know, over the hundred. So <laughs> y y you should use all the time in the best way you can, because uh, time is time is the real precious thing, because you mm -hmm. can't buy it, you can't make it, you can't earn it. You only have whatever time God is going to give you. And um, uh, so that's that's the answer to that. And well, my next question was going to be, what do you do to unwind and chill out or do for fun? So I'm going to presume from that answer that you enjoy being out in the farm and you enjoy working like you're not really. A oh, yeah. Yeah. Like if, if I if 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 you see me doing some job that somebody else might consider to be working like that's my golf course. Like right. I, 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 I like nothing in the world against people who do those <laughs> sort of things. Um, how, how would I put it? Um, that like people who do you know like going on a holiday like that, uh, well, th that to me would be actually a waste of time. Like I I I I like doing ordinary jobs, and that's me having my holiday. But right. if if I know it's an old cliche and an old sort of a thing, or oh, if you find something you like doing, you'll never work a day the rest of the days of your life. Like I like what I'm doing, do you know, mm -hmm. whether it's here in the office whether I'm at home helping out in the shop, whether if, uh, if I'm driving a digger, if I'm working in construction, if I'm doing anything like that, whatever will put me at, I'm quite happy. Like if I was told, get out of this building this minute and get a brush and go out brush in the yard outside, like I would actually be quite happy brushing the yard. And like everybody knows that's the truth. That's me. I just like doing something all the time once it's productive and once I can see some class of a good result at the end of it I'm quite happy <laughs> Jeez, I wish I was more like you honestly well what God, did... you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is something about you that we don't know that people will be surprised to find out oh sure I don't know what's in the name of God I sure <laughs> but the... <laughs> I, I suppose um, there's nothing really about me that people don't know. Um, I'm a sort of an open book. I don't hide anything. Mm. We'll say educationally, I would have found things diff difficult when I was growing up because I couldn't read or write. Mm. And, um, yeah. and I had a, a lot of problems with that. And uh, there's a great sense of satisfaction when you overcome it. It was a nun by the name of Sister Regina in Killarney. Uh, she's still alive. Um, she taught me how to read and write, uh, we'll call it later in the time. In other words, I, I would have been very far behind uh, with all that sort of stuff. And um, But I was delighted one day when we were sort of being introduced to each other and we were after having lots of conversations and she, she told me that I did have a brain. I was delighted to hear that. <laughs> and, uh, and because I was, I was starting to have my doubts. And uh, she, she, she described it in a lovely way. She said, your mind is full of small locks. And she said, not only do I have to get a key for each lock, but I have to make the keys. And she said, as I will open it up, she said, you will see that you actually do have a good mind. And she seemed to believe in my thought process and my way of analyzing things. And when I go to schools now, 
and when I meet uh, children that have, um, we'll say, I'll, I'll always spot right away the child who has the ACNA, the special needs assistant, because it's obvious there's, you know, an, an adult person sitting with this younger person. Yeah. But I always try to engage with those people because, my God, what I see when I talk to people like that, uh, and we, we'll, we'll word it this way, when I'm talking to the special child in the class, I can see why the child is special because I don't see the disability, I see the ability. I remember one time I was chairman of a Neuroctus committee and in the course of that every week I would be meeting ambassadors from around Europe, but um, I remember one time taking an ambassador to uh, visit Kerry uh, uh, and subsequently to a school and there was a special boy in the class and uh, the ambassador had brought a couple of gifts and he was going to ask a few questions. Sure, every question that he asked, the person, we'll call it, that uh, was the special person, was answering every question. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a little discussion afterwards with the person taking care of him. Sure, <laughs> what was wrong with the boy was, the boy was a genius. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed to be the person in the class that had, uh, we'll say, special needs and requirements. Yeah. He was an absolute genius. Mm -hmm. And whatever that child will do for the rest of his life, I don't know how he'll get on because yeah. the, 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 what's wrong with him is his brain is is better than everyone else's. <laughs> yeah. And he's better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And it's just trying to contain that monster that's inside in his mind, which makes him maybe appear as though we'll call it, and I mean this with a question mark, something wrong with him. What's wrong with him? Is there something right with him? <laughs> and that type of stuff is is a, like he, he's bordering on genius ability. Yeah. And uh, so like people who might have trouble with the ordinary functioning of life, uh, the reason they do so is because their mind is operating at a different level and mm -hmm. they're thinking differently. Their thought process is different to everybody else. So an awful lot of the time, um, th that's what's actually wrong with people who need extra assistance with education and things like that. So I'd like to think that young people get the, the early uh, diagnosis, which they don't in Ireland uh, because uh, of lack of services. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'd like to see children who have learning difficulties being diagnosed early because if you don't know what the problem is, you can't find the solution for it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great example, though, for people who, you know, struggle with reading and writing and to show that, like, here you are now, like, as a TD and you struggle with reading and writing and it doesn't mean anything. Like, you can obviously go to even higher places, even if you're struggling in school. Or, or you can, like, sure, I mean, look at some of the business people you have in the world. Exactly. Uh, the, 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 their educational background might be minimal. Yeah. And... Uh, and like some of the people who I would know that would be what we'd call very successful, uh, what they always say to me is that, oh, yeah, sure, we didn't have time for, for education because we were too busy working <laughs> and, uh, mm. and, and doing the things that made them successful. And like, don't get me wrong now, I'm not knocking education. I'm a great admirer of education, quite simply because I didn't probably avail of it enough myself. I didn't do a leaving certificate. And uh, what I obviously love to see other people do it. I love <laughs> to see people going to university quite simply because I didn't get to do it myself. I love to see people getting degrees and all that sort of thing. Again, because I didn't do it. And I admire people who do that. And, and I, I get satisfaction out of people doing things that I didn't do because I think, isn't that great? You know? yeah. and, and I like that. So I, I never ever would anybody you know, say, oh, I'm a knocker on the education and start to say, oh, that's a waste of time. But I would say one thing. Uh, there are people in life who it is a waste of time for them to, to get too involved in the educational system because yeah. they might be happier and they might be more successful staying away from it. Yeah. Uh, so if you have certain flair or ability, I do the example, say that you're a young boy or girl and you're a great mechanic and you have a great mechanical mind and that your, your, your thing is fixing things. Well, for you maybe to give years inside in, in a class learning about things that you'll never use, that will never be of any assistance to, you might be better off do, do, at that time out working, doing the work that God gave you the mindset for. And um, so like, again, coming back to the thing about time being such a finite thing, 
you might be better off sometimes just going far and doing what you uh, like doing and don't waste your time doing things that you see no benefit in. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Like sc- the school system isn't always for everyone, like especially if you're more if you're more creative, if you're more physical like that, like a mechanic or a welder or a plumber or whatever it might be like there's different routes to go, we'll say. Yes. Um, so I got in a few questions now as well from people who follow me on Instagram. So I'm going to ask their questions. They wanted to ask you a few questions. So first question is, what is Leo Varadkar's most fairy-like quality? <laughs> oh God, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a politically incorrect question. Um, I, 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 I like being positive about everybody. Uh, we talk about the good qualities that people have. Any person that goes into politics, in my opinion, they go into it for what they believe to be the right reasons. We can sometimes have disagreement with people because they think that their way is the right way. Mm -hmm. And their way might actually be a way that you have disagreements with. At present, uh, we have a government uh, who are made up of uh, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and the Greens. Now, you often heard of the tail uh, wagging the dog. Well, at this stage, the tail has shook the life out of the dog. In <laughs> other words, the dog being Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, the tail being the Greens. Right. Now, I have nothing in the world against the Green agenda, nothing. I'm not a climate change denier. That Absolutely not. I believe that the real environmentalists in Ireland and the world are the people who own it. In other words, the farmers, the people who own farmland, the people who own forestry, they're the people, they want to keep our waterways clean. They want to improve their land. They want to make a living from the land. Land is a living, usable source that you have to, you're given it. You don't own it. Land is not a possession. You're a custodian of it to pass, because I never saw yet a person dying and taking their land into the grave with them. You know, you would even have to leave it after you. And uh, so you're only using it for your time and pass it on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the whole carbon reduction issue, like Ireland at present is being asked by our politicians to do what I don't want to say impossible things, but uh, uh, we're being asked to go very fast uh, in a very short length of time, going from where we are now to a massive reduction in in our carbon emissions. Now, in doing so, they're doing very hurtful things to people who are trying to live today, older people, young, struggling families. Uh, I mean, we're crippled with uh, inflation here at the moment. And at the same time, the government are hell bent on putting in more carbon taxes uh, Mm -hmm. in the month of May. I mean, forcing people through carbon taxes to change the way they live is not the right way to go. There are sensible practical measures that we can take that don't mean, uh, with, with regard to protect our environment, which don't mean taxing the living daylights out of pe- people. People are terrorized at the moment. Like, and our government are telling everybody, use more electricity, change from, um, we'll say, solid fuels to oh, electric. Everything is electric. And at the same time, what are they doing? They're giving us no additional uh, supply of energy. Um, I, I believe that we should have an LNG facility in Ireland. Um, an argument I had recently with Leo, Leo Varadkar was the fact that Fine Gael uh, put together a, a commission to mm-hmm. look at this whole energy, uh, this whole question about energy security. They came back and said, we should have an LNG facility, a publicly owned LNG facility. When I highlighted that uh, to uh, Mr. Varadkar, that his own party, uh, that they have come up with this and at the same time he's saying no we shouldn't have an LNG facility so I mean would people get their act together and sing off the same hymn sheet and, and realize we do need energy security we can't be over reliant on France and, and, and England to give us uh, power because the lights will go out and uh, stopping people for instance of using solid fuel turf if it's what's readily available to them and if that's what their family used to heat themselves, it's an awful thing to tell people, well, we're going to stop you of doing that. Uh, Ireland has always done their best. Ireland is a very uh, a good country, in my opinion, for protecting our environment. If you look at what happens in places like China and, 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 and North America, look what's happening to our rainforest. I mean, 
we, we, we are a good nation for doing our best at all times. But now we're being asked to become the leaders in Europe and the leaders in the world with regard to carbon reduction. And what I'm saying is we can't afford to do it in the way and at the speed that the government are now asking us, quite simply because they're being dictated to by the Green Party, because for their own political survival, then it's a case of, well, we better do, like Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil are after becoming more green than the Green Party. And uh, they're all trying to outdo each other with green policies. But what they're forgetting is the human beings who have to survive and who have to pay these additional taxes. Mm -hmm. And now you'll be sorry you asked me that, this question because <laughs> I'm in a bit of a rant now. So sorry. <laughs> no, no, it is good to talk about it. But in relation to the exchange of words that you had um, a couple of days ago, you said that you think that Leo Varadkar looks down his nose at you. And then, first of all, why why do you think that? Well, you see, some politicians and, like, I believe everybody is equal and I believe that we're all the exact same and people who are elected, um, no other person has uh, a bigger, uh, how do we say, right to being right than anybody else. But some people inside the doll, and I'm not talking about anybody in particular, but some people have an attitude problem. In other words, uh, they think they're better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And they think they're smarter than everybody else. And, and in other words, they get notions about themselves. And I've seen it inside here. I, I, I always remember this thing of, I wasn't here that long, maybe a couple of years. And there was a particular minister at the time. And... Um, I'd always have my manners when I'd meet people and especially somebody who's here longer than you are and especially somebody who will say is further up the chain than you. And there was this one particular minister. Every time I used to meet him, I'd always say, hello, minister, how are you? And he'd never answer me, never. And one night, or it was late at night, and you know, <laughs> I suppose maybe I was a bit cranky and I was walking along the corridor and this minister was coming against me. And I, I sort of got this idea in my head and I was very pleasant. I had a smile on my face and I said, hello, minister, how are you? And he kept walking. But if he did, I took one quick look around and there was no, no one else around. I said, stop there one minute. And he stopped. And let's put it this way. I had a frank exchange of words with him, which started something like this. Who in the name of God do you think you are? You see? I, and I said, since I came here, I, I've been nice to you. I've smiled at you. I've uh, pay, paid the time of day to you. And you never once answered me. And I said, why, like, why? What, what makes you look down on me that I'm such an inferior person that you wouldn't? I mean, even if you don't like me, you could say hello uh, or, or, you know, grunt or do something. And, like, and I did say to him, I said, a pig actually grunts. You know, if we, mm -hmm. if we talked at a pig, or, or a pig would look at you and would grunt at you. But this person wouldn't even make a grunt. And uh, But I'll tell you one thing. Um, I put him thinking a little bit that night mm -hmm. because I, I sort of told him exactly from the balls of his toes up to the top of his head. I told him what I thought about him, his behaviour, and he was a very well educated and a very well read, read man. But in my humble opinion, he was nothing but a thick, ingrant ball of a donkey. Because any person that would think that he was so smart that he could pass a person without saluting him and beat him the time of day. But um, uh, so things like that I don't like. People yeah, thinking that they're better than somebody else. Yeah. And you know, if you meet real powerful people and people who are in big positions in life, you know, they're the people who are awful nice altogether. And, and they have no attitude problem about themselves or they don't like they can see the bigger picture that every one of us are the exact same. Exactly. Every one of us are going to a hole. There is no person, <laughs> if you're a pauper or a millionaire, everyone is the exact same. Yeah. And for some person to think that, oh, well, you know, I, I won't say hello to this person. Like, that's all rubbish, like nonsense. Yeah, that is true. I completely agree with you there. But the that conversation that you had the other day as well you, where how was it taken because I've seen it in the news and I've seen articles where 
it's taken or he's taken it that you've made homophobic comments. But and I watched it and I was watching it and I was thinking, Jesus, what's he after saying? And the only thing that you said was, go away with your airy fairies. Yes. Well, you see, I'll clarify one thing for you. Yeah. And uh, other uh, eminent uh, journalists in Ireland have said that the word has been used a couple of times in the doll. The word airy fairy has been used in the doll and the Shannon and the houses of the Arachnus, in other words, Arachnus committees, 314 times. <laughs> and isn't it awful unusual that when I use it once, now I, I, I sorry, don't get me wrong, I've used it numerous, numerous times. <laughs> but when I use it once uh, in the context of a conversation or a debate with one individual, everyone seems to jump up, or should I say, because of his reaction, everyone jumps up and says, oh my God, like I would never, and I'm sure you know from this interview and from every interview I've ever done in my life, I would never purposely set out to offend, upset, or do anything to anybody. And when it comes to boys and girls, and girls and girls are boys and boys, I would, I don't want to know what people's business is. I don't want to know what people's private lives are and what they do. That to me is, it's like what we were talking about earlier on. That's, that's a different, that's out there. That's different awesome. stuff. <laughs> uh, exactly. And like, I, Trini Mac, I, I would never uh, bring a person's um, uh, private business into a public debate not mm -hmm. if not for all the gold in china like that wouldn't have anything to do with a political debate but i often use the term airy fairy ideas and like for example we were talking about carbon like it is an airy fairy idea for mm -hmm. any political leader in ireland to think that by 2030 we'll have got gotten rid of every diesel engine and that people will be able to pull big loads with lorries and tractors operating with a battery engine like that technology is not there yet and it won't be developed are affordable by 2030 yeah. and any person that thinks that it will be is full of airy fairy ideas <laughs> and I mean nothing insulting to any yeah. sector of society when I say that but I will ask people who think that I was insulting mm -hmm. and like the little postcard and the, the person who wrote their lovely card to me yesterday would they look at the other 314 times that the word airy fairy was used in the doll. Will they go back to those people and will they tell them that they were being homophobic, that they were being insulting, that they were being downgrading? Because like, just because I do it, it's insulting. The other 313 people, were they all fine so? <laughs> and like this idea that, oh, it was never used before until now when it was used in particularly to this one man. Nonsense, raving rubbish. Yeah. But I, I just couldn't believe it because I saw the headline before I saw the video. And then I, so I was waiting for some comment. And then you said what you said and it moved on. And I was thinking, well, where was the comment? And then his, like airy fairy, I think to the whole of Ireland has its meaning. And it's just away with the fairies. It's not, it's nothing to do with, I couldn't see the correlation with the two things. So. But, 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 but look, sure, I've had people contact me saying, how dare I call a person a name inside in the doll? Because that again, they only half listened. They listened to news yeah. reports and they only half listened to it. And they, they, in other words, they added two and two when they got seven. Exactly. Yeah. So that's always the case as well. Exactly. Like, whereas if you just read that headline, like I did initially, you just hear the headline and you think, geez, what's he after saying inside in the doll? But when I watched that's the right. video, I was like, well, he didn't say anything. So exactly. But look, that's just uh, I, I, I'm not here to defend myself. The way I word it is that let people listen to the facts. and uh, But don't be like some journalists who won't let the facts get in the way of a good story. And <laughs> like people have written horrible things about me in the last couple of weeks you now and or the last few days in particular about this. But like, again, do I take notice of it? Not at all. And yeah. I always remind the journalist who, who writes sloppily and who writes uh, non-factual stories and who just tries to put themselves up by putting some other person down. Is that what their parents worked hard for and sent them to school for and made sacrifices for them to come go, go along uh, to put themselves in a position of, of writing about people just 
a, you know, not being factual about it, but just to try and make the other person look bad, to create sensationalism and to focus hatred. And that's fine. And there's no problem with that. And uh, you're supposed to take that on the chin then because, oh, well, that's politics. But mm -hmm. like, it's fine if, if, if I did do something wrong. And oh my goodness, if I stood up and if I uh, purposely insulted somebody or said something nasty or dirty, uh, of course you should be called out for it. And of course you should be made apologize. And to people who've said to me uh, that, oh, of course you should apologize. Should I be the biggest hypocrite in the world if I apologized? Because I'm not resp responsible for the interpretation that another person takes out of something. If a person doesn't understand uh, a word or a mannerism or something, that's not my fault. Mm -hmm. And uh, if a person is so uptight about something that they perceive it to be against them when it's actually not, I'm not responsible for that. And the journalists that write about it, they should act responsibly. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah, of course. That, I mean, that's true. You can't, you, you, if you've not done anything wrong or said anything purposely, which you could see in the video, the minute he said it, you were the, the face of confusion. So obviously just looking at your face, you could see there was no intent there. But anyways, moving on from that and a few more questions from other people, more lighthearted questions. Somebody wants to know, where do you get your caps? Quills, uh, <laughs> woolen markets in the, in Killarney, uh, in the inside there always takes care of me. Um, oh. Hats of Ireland make the hats, and uh, uh, I like them. That's it. <laughs> Does it ever come off your head? Do you take it off when you're going to sleep? Uh, ah, what should I do? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I've always worn caps. So I, um, just one second. No, just you're one. all right. I, I I'll ring you back in a couple of minutes. Janja, okay, okay. Sorry, no, I, no, you're I, I just... No, you're fine. Yeah. I, I'm nearly finished, Suzanne. I know I've taken up your time. Um, Another question is, how many funerals do you go to a year? And is it true that you use your own colour pen for the condolences book? <laughs> I've, I've, I've read that. And like, again, absolute nonsensical nonsense. I think it was a journalist <laughs> who was trying to poke fun out of me that actually wrote that. Right. Uh, one thing I've never in my life been at a funeral of a person that I didn't know, right. that I didn't have a connection with, or that I wasn't friends with the family. Mm -hmm. Very sadly, an awful lot of what I do is health related. And uh, uh, people might come to me when they're starting out on a journey of illness. And if I don't know that person, I, it, it's, I mightn't be long getting to know them. And I'd like to think that we go on the journey together. Uh, it could be they could the family members could be looking for cares allowance they could be looking for um a medical card assistance with hospital appointments all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and when that person then as is inevitable sadly sometimes they pass away it would be the height of bad manners it would be very awkward not to go and be with the family because you've been with them all along and uh, there's a great comfort in meeting people that have been working with you and assisting you. And, uh, you know, journalists, again, a lot of them, which are maybe they have no friends themselves, they don't get it that a person has an awful lot of friends, mm -hmm. an awful lot of people that you'll be connected with. And uh, uh, that's, that's why I would go to say goodbye to people. Yeah. And uh, it's part of life. And it's part of being friendly. It's part of being in a community. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And my next question, and I'll leave it at this question, is will you ever go for Taoiseach? Well, <laughs> maybe I'd be doing good if I'd be able to hold on to the position I have. <laughs> uh, when, when, when people say about, oh, will you go for this position or that position or this job or that job? Uh, always remember, when you're in politics, whether it's local or national, it's the people who are your bosses. If, if the people of Kerry want me, they can have me uh, because they can vote for me. If they don't want me at any time that they say that, uh, well, we don't want you, we don't like you, we don't support you anymore. Well, th they're the bosses and it's their choice. And one thing I will say about politics is when you see what is happening, 
uh, in the Ukraine at the moment, and when you see Russia, mm -hmm. when we give out about democracies, you have to look at what's happening over there and think that, well, isn't democracy great? Yeah. Isn't it great to have leaders who are elected, whether you like them or not? And uh, a while ago, I was complaining and giving out about Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil and the Greens. Uh, while I might give out about their policies, while I might give out about their governance, I absolutely appreciate, believe in, and am fully committed to the fact that we are so thankful that we have a democracy, that we have a political process, that the people are the bosses, the yeah. people on the ground, they are the they are they are our our, our ruling uh, governing guide, and uh, so I can only be here for as long as the people want me to be there, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I humbly appreciate it. I like the job. I hope I give a good service. I will always try my best. I will always do everything I can to help people. Uh, and and the day then that I won't run and that I won't be before the people is if I felt that I wasn't able to keep doing what I do in the level that I do it at. In other words, I would never run if I thought, oh, I'm not good enough now to, to do what I used to do. Like yeah. we'll say, for instance, Monday night, I was doing clinics in, um, in South Kerry, which so for people who know Kerry, it was Blackwater, Sneem, Castle Cove, Cahandandal, uh, Waterville, Master Gihi, Balanced Skellings, Port McGee, Valinch Island, and Carras And that was that night. And at the same time, like I left Valinch Island at half past 12 or one o'clock on Monday night. And at the same time, at eight or nine o'clock, I was here in Dublin the following morning. And like the day that I couldn't do that yeah. or not be able to do it, well, then I won't try to do it because I'll say to the people, right, I'm not able to do that now anymore. So uh, I won't be asking you to support me anymore. But as long as I think I can do it and that I'm able to do it, I, I, I would like to do it if, if I'll be given the opportunity. Yeah. So, Michael. You're some man, and thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. I know we had a couple of um, uh, <laughs> communication difficulties, <laughs> of, of, of all of which I'm sure are my fault. But, no, but, no, but, yes, they were my fault, anyways. <laughs> but 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 we but we we got there in, we got in there, the yeah. end anyway, and we have a lovely, pleasant way of doing the interview, and I appreciate oh, that you. very much. And uh, and and I, could I just say to all the people who are abroad, uh, I, I I hope for two things. I hope that you'll always be lucky and always be happy because that's one thing we never got to discuss too much was look. Uh, you know, in life, uh, look has an awful lot to do with it because sure you could be very smart, you could be very intelligent, and you could step out in front of the bus and get knocked down. So <laughs> like you know, look has an awful lot to do with life and. Uh, if we're lucky, you can get away with a lot. And uh, I love to see young people getting on and uh, young couples starting out. Uh, I'd always remind people that they are away. Don't forget about us. Do no, if we, we could <laughs> Yes, if he, if he do see your, your way, if it's possible, I'd always try to canvas people to come home. Um, <laughs> you know, like, and, and and I'm not interfering with your business or anything, but but like the people that are abroad don't start to think, well, Ireland is a no go zone for us. Mm -hmm. um, like I had uncles and aunties who left Ireland and who sadly didn't come home. They stayed in America. But I always think, well, what would have been what would it have been like, you know, if they could have been here and had their families here? But I know that can't happen all the time. But all I'm saying is to young people, don't shut it down, don't pull down the shutter and say we're never going back to Ireland. Like, you know, maybe opportunities would arise. And uh, keep an open mind is the way I'll put it. Ah, oh, we will. I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I think most of us will come back eventually. Most of us will. Well, eventually. well that's good. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Make make balls of money and bring it all back to Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's no fear of us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So, thanks all so the much, best. Michael. All the best. Thanks for having me with you. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks for taking the time because I know yeah. you're so busy, but thank you. No problem. No okay. Problem. Bye bye.